I'm Alex Nemirov, and uh, this is the third of my six lectures um, about the forest, America in the 1830s. And the title of my lecture, as you can see here today, is called The Aesthetics of Superstition. And what's at stake here, again, is this relation, maybe it's just a mystical or magical relation, between art and life. You know, I guess I'm naive enough to believe that the two things might at least at one point or periodically coincide. What would that look like? How would it be achieved? Perhaps even you could say at what cost might it be achieved? Uh, how can we countenance like um, the superstition that um, life itself could enter into a work of art? And how could we countenance even more than that how the historian looking at the past is really someone who works in superstition, who works in a kind of necromancy which has to do with summoning something that couldn't possibly be words on a page or words out of a speaker's mouth as yet uh, identical with uh, something that is remote, that is gone. So let me get into this here with uh, one such example of the relation of art and life. So on the early morning hours of April 10th, 1836, in Lower Manhattan, there occurred a famous murder in a house of prostitution at 41 Thomas Street, just off of Broadway, uh, where the 23-year-old prostitute, Helen Jewett, uh, sleeping in her mahogany bed in, um, in a brothel, was killed by her um, male suitor that evening. Uh, the man who was charged with the crime and who had been with her that night was a young man named Richard P. Robinson. These were both young people in New York. Uh, Helen Jewett, who also went by Ellen Jewett, but whose real name was Dorcas, D-O-R-C-A-S, Doyen, D-O-Y-E-N, was from Maine, was from Hallowell, Maine, small town not far from Augusta, Maine, in the heart of lumber country, just on the Kennebec River, down which they floated the logs uh, for the mills of Augusta. Um, Helen Jewett um, went, came to New York at age 19 in 1832, uh, after having been uh, a servant girl in a house, in a kind of upper crust house in Augusta run by a guy named Nathan Weston. It was his house. He was a judge. Ellen Jewett, who was a very widely read person, in whose room in the brothel was uh, a picture of Lord Byron, uh, works of Sir Walter Scott, um, issues of the Knickerbocker, um, there with her kind, kind of deep, almost like mm, beyond just being a John, deep connection, uh, this guy Richard P. Robinson, who was a young clerk in New York, who lived on Day Street, not far from Thomas Street, Day Street, the boarding house where 19-year-old Richard P. Robinson from Durham, Connecticut, outside New Haven, lived is basically where the 9-11 uh, Memorial Plaza is now. So uh, their relationship was tempestuous. Um, Richard P. Robinson, for one reason or another, decided that uh, he would uh, kill her. He did so with an ax, made in Connecticut. <laughs> some, one of some 2,500 at such axes traced in New York City, but one of which was in uh, Richard P. Robinson's place of employment and which had mysteriously gone missing. Three solid uh, strikes to the skull, no sign of struggle, probably as in this 1849 picture, Helen Jewett was asleep. Um, she was killed instantly. Richard P. Robinson, who was um, a sociopath, also a psychopath, uh, although he was acquitted for this crime based on some very shady dealings in the judiciary. Nonetheless, uh, Richard P. Robinson, whose own father had written to him, urging him not to go to New York, saying, son, I fear that you are the child of the devil, to which Richard P. Robinson, a very smart and arch kind of uh, man, uh, said in his diary, uh, uh, the old man is too hard on himself. Uh, <laughs> I dislike such paternity. 
So Richard P. Robinson got away with murder, as Patricia Klein Cohen remarks in her beautiful book published in 1998 called The Murder of Helen Jewett, on which I draw um, today. Here is, though, the coincidence. In that same brothel at 41 Thomas Street in <clears throat> New York was this painting, probably, uh, a painting of an, if not an ax murder, then a tomahawk murder. What, what is it, and why was it there? It's a painting by the early 19th century painter John Vanderlyn, and it uh, shows a Revolutionary War scene showing the death of Jane McRae in 1777. The painting was made in 1804. You can see it at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Connecticut. It's like 32 by 26 inches. Uh, Jane McRae, who was... Um, you know, uh, living near Fort Edward, not far from Glens Falls, uh, was going for a rendezvous with her lover, who is shown belatedly uh, hurrying to the scene here, uh, David Jones, who was also a Tory, and through one way or another, recriminations were traded back and forth afterwards. The Indian allies of Burgoyne, of the British, killed her, and this is what John Vanderlyn shows in a kind of anti-British screed from a generation after the Revolutionary War. The painting is strange. You know, I always feel that David Jones running along, like there's something about his smallness which implies that even when he gets to the foreground, he will still be just as small. <laughs> but in other ways, I regard this as one of the greatest of all American paintings. And why? Because it shows violence in a genuinely disturbing way. Most American pictures of violence will find some way to euphemize or sentimentalize it, but this really is barring nothing in a, in a kind of Davidian neoclassical rhetoric. Jane's look up at this man about to kill her, the strong grasp of the wrist, wrists, the fierce grasp of her hair as she is about to be scalped, the whole kind of motor mechanics of bodily um, destruction and dismemberment, indeed ruthless murder, presented front and center with no euphemism. It's a very rare kind of picture, and it was there, or perhaps a copy of it was there, but it's very conceivable based on the uh, uh, provenance of this picture that it itself was in the parlor of um, Rosina Townsend's brothel. She was the madam. So, this is my relation of art and life with James Gordon Bennett, the editor of the New York Herald, the kind of uh, original penny press newspaper with a massive circulation then of 77,000. James Gordon Bennett didn't spare a connection between the crime and the painting among his, amidst his prolific coverage of this sensational murder. And by the way, the museum here across the street has actually the original New York Herald from April 11th, 1836, in which if your eyesight is good enough, you can read Bennett's whole account of this murder. Uh, Bennett says, much like someone would say now about watching violent shows on TV or pornography, that basically this was a, a kind of incentive or possibly put the idea in Robinson's head, though I think Robinson actually had a long build up to this kind of uh, crime in his life with or without this painting. Patricia Klein Cohen, who writes the book, says, you know, there's a lot of other emotions that could have been going through the mind of any um, John in that, in that house of prostitution waiting uh, in the parlor, uh, anxiety about performance, uh, anxiety about secrecy, all kinds of things, so that it hardly squares with, necessarily for her, with the idea that this picture is simply synonymous with the goings on in such a place. Nonetheless, it is a weird, apart from how one reads it, it's a weird, superstitious combination of art and life, uncanny, strange, etc. And it prompts me now to think about what is this, how, how do art and life come together superstitiously in other ways? Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a kind of melancholy and lyricism to what I'm therefore about to say. So, <clears throat> 1832, in Rome, Thomas Cole, uh, the Hudson River painter whose work we've encountered before, uh, is there on a trip to Italy, taking in the sights, seeing the old masters and the classical sculptures. And in 
1832, he makes this painting, which you can see at the Baltimore Museum of Art, head of a Roman woman. Uh, it's 24 by 20 inches. It's actually right next to that painting, A Wild Scene, which I talked about in the first lecture. Probably this is a model named Maria di, uh, di Sora, uh, of whom there is a drawing by Cole at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston showing her front face, but we, we can't see here, can't know. Now, what is, how is this going to be about this relation of the real and art? I'll just say this, that when I look at this painting, in person and also in this slide, I feel that I am somehow in the presence of the real, and I'll give you three reasons why I feel this is so. So one has to do with nearness, like the, the figure of the model is so um, crowded up towards us, and I know when I'm reading fiction from the 1830s or from any period for that matter, my, my attention always gathers when I feel something is being brought in words or paint, um, or in words close to my eyes. So there's an aesthetic of nearness where you look at, um, say, the, the lacing of her bodice, et cetera, here, or this kind of um, this sort of triangular design, repeated triangle, triangular design of her uh, collar. And this nearness kind of shows that a second thing, which is that we can't really put her into a narrative. This is the model before she's been converted into a narrative. It's just the model herself. There's a sense of the realness of the painter before the model uh, making the picture, before we're to understand that she's Aphrodite or uh, a, a, a mistress or a, a housewife or whatever the narrative is going to be. So there's something about this pre-story, pre-narrative moment that also makes me feel this is a sen gives a sense of the real. And here's the third thing, which is maybe the most strange, uh, for me at least, and that is the unknowability of the figure. And, you know, Cole has painted her with that lost profile, and, and um, obviously her back is turned, but we really are deprived the pleasure or the expectation that we'd be able to see at least some part of her face, to fill in our, her face at least with our mind's eye. And, you know, Cole always had trouble with figure painting. His lost profile is not going to be on a par with, say, the lost profiles I can think of from the history of art by, say, Velazquez in The Spinners or Courbet in The Wheat Sifters. But it's almost because of its awkwardness, it has all the more a kind of power of the real. In other words, the real as it comes to us, as this picture suggests, is something that is incomplete or unknowable, is almost the way I might metaphysically describe it, that as fulsome and as near as the figure is, so that you can almost feel the, the velvet of the fabric she wears, or whatever fabric it is, nonetheless she retreats from us, she cannot be known. So I would see this almost as an eruption of the real in a work of art, almost you know, precisely because it is one of these paintings that Cole, I don't think, placed too much stock in, his mind always being on larger things, narratives, allegories, symbolizations, et cetera, et cetera. Let's look at another kind of uncanny manifestation of the real from that time. It's this painting on the screen uh, but from 1838 by an artist named William Sidney Mount, who we've encountered before, the Long Island painter, it's called uh, The Fortune Teller, or Dregs in the Cup. And what it shows is an older woman, uh, perhaps meant to be a gypsy, looking into the cup here, the teacup, to read the tea leaves to see what is implied about the future of one of these two women. I would suggest it might be this one, the younger, kind of more virginally clad one who shyly uh, conceals her giggling face with part of her bonnet as the older, more protective figure, a friend or um, an older sister, perhaps, um, or a mother looks on here keenly. So partly what you can understand with this picture is that this is a middle class culture, you know, that is, uh, that can't shed superstition fast enough, that can't poke fun at it fast enough that is busily speeding towards as quick an embrace as it can of what we call skeptical rationality. So no belief, no faith, it all must be proven. 
it all must be empirical, but, but which is also willing in a kind of, um, kind of humorous, satirical, but somehow you know, serious way to countenance the superstition it also wants to vanquish, to put to the sidelines. So that's partly one way to read this, but there's another thing about this picture which fascinates me, and I guess it doesn't concern the theme as such, and it's this, it's the size of the painting, which I think touches on superstition in a lot of ways, and what do I mean by that? This is the largest painting Mount ever made. Most of his pictures, like the one here at the National Gallery, are quite small, but this is 42 by 52 inches, and the figures are half size, or half, fate, half uh, length, and also they are in Mount's phrase, which he repeated several times in his letters about this painting, um, the size of life. So the size of life. Now, Mount's depiction of these life-size figures may be unconvincing by degrees. They have a kind of waxen quality, but nonetheless, there's a sense here that even as the painting pokes fun at superstition, it also um, wants to superstitiously believe in the exact match, the size of life between life and the figures in the painting. And when I look at this painting and I see half length and I see 42 by 52 inches, as an art historian, I get excited because that makes me think of the 17th century. And I think um, in particular that what we are seeing here in this comparison, which is between Caravaggio's incredulity of Thomas, or the doubting Thomas here on the left from 1600 to 01, and this painting by Mount from 1838 is a kind of fateful declension or working through or modifying of the old time um, cath super Catholic language of absolute um, faith that is embodied not just in the narrative with Thomas, the disbeliever being instructed, indeed being guided by Jesus to stick his finger directly into the wound made by the lance in his side with the other apostles looking on, the incredulity of Thomas, but also of course a faith that's manifest in Caravaggio's extraordinary painting style where in a painting that is basically the same size as Mount's, this is 42 by 57 inches, uh, wants to give you figures the size of life, crowded to the foreground and made to appear uh, virtually in a way, as is famously said about Caravaggio, that violates the boundary or the plane between his pictured world and our world and makes the two become blurringly one and the same. What you're looking at from left to right is, it, it reminds me almost of, say, the way a joke or a story told first or a secret told first by one person to another and then whispered into the ear of another and so on and so on. If you go with the secret starting from 1600, this is how the same secret winds up in 1838. It has somehow morphed from the most uh, extraordinary bodily intensities and, and matters of extreme faith from the Gospel of John. And there's a book by Glenn Most that beautifully articulates the theme of Doubting Thomas uh, that I rely on for my take on this picture, all the way out into a kind of polite middle-class fantasy, a kind of um, you know pleasant, sentimental satire of some kind, and yet with some of the same uh, motifs or bodily presences still visible. So for example, this hand I always think here, and just the whole, see here, here, the gesturing. Mount doesn't know this, of course, but he, like any serious painter, is inheriting a whole tradition of how you make narrative paintings, how you make figures the size of life, how you make, um, uh, why you would even try for a uh, half-length painting, etc. So superstition still lurks in this picture somehow, and it mounts a good person to stay on that when we think of the aesthetics of superstition, the way life itself, though it's disguised, that we're no longer fingering the blood and flesh, but rather um, some sort of um, prognostication we pretend not to be interested in, uh, carries forth in his art. So for example, here is another painting by William Sidney Mount from the 1830s. It's a portrait of a young man, 15 years old, named Jedediah Williamson. 
16 by 13 inches, quite a small picture, and we might think nothing of it. You could see it at the museum at Stony Brook, where Mount is from. Um, it's very, uh, you know, he's very proximate, very close, but interestingly, he was dead at the time, and um, this is a letter from Mount from just, just the year before, December 1836. He's writing to his brother, the fiddler and dancing master, Robert Nelson Mount, who was in Macon, Georgia at the time, and he says, about by way of news of the neighborhood, several serious accidents have happened since you left. Jedediah Williamson, the son of Colonel William Williamson, is dead. It is supposed he was killed instantly. He was run over by a loaded cordwood wagon. He was alone at the time. And I think Robert Nelson Mount's response from Macon a little bit later, the mail having reached him, is indicative too of this, this, this world where death and life are kind of merged somehow. Such intelligence is not surprising to me. I never break the seal of a letter that comes from home without expecting to be informed by it that a friend, if not a relative, has departed to return no more. So this painting here on the right is a posthumous painting. It was made in 1837 uh, for a fee of $15, commissioned by Williamson's uh, family. And it is nothing if not superstitious, right? It is about kind of bodying forth a deceased soul in the flesh, now we understand the, the urgent proximity of the face. And you know, it always reminds me of the celebrated Fayum portraits from the first to third century AD in Egypt. Um, you can see them at many museums, uh, so named because of the location in Egypt where they were found in caustic, so paint and uh, wax on wood. You can see the wooden support there of um, a particular Greek community in Egypt controlled by the Romans. So as John Berger says in his piece about these pictures, a, uh, an amalgam, a kind of polyglot amalgam of styles and uh, beliefs, um, regular middle-class people who had their portraits made either right after decease, as perhaps happened with this young boy, or else um, before their decease so that these paintings could be um, placed on their sarcophagi, and then in the late 19th century, they were rediscovered, and you can now see them. You know, there's something about that direct gaze, that life after life, and more than that, the, like, the, the, as Berger says, the kind of bloom of, of earthy flesh itself manifest in these pictures across so many years that makes them continually, and I would say superstitiously, spellbinding. We feel that a representation has not only defeated death, but has become what it represents. You know, in the grand, glorious stretch of the past, you know, who's to say that 1837 in Long Island isn't finally as distant, you could even say hallucinatorily more distant than third century Egypt, and that finally Jedediah Williamson is the mummy of himself in Mount's portrayal. Here at the National Gallery, when we talk about superstition, uh, you know, there's this fantastic painting by Domenico Fetti uh, from circa 1618 to 22. Uh, uh, showing the veil of Veronica, that is the veil that, or handkerchief on which um, uh, Veronica, uh, by whom um, Christ passed on his way to Calvary, uh, wiped Christ's brow, thereby leaving a miraculous image. Uh, the Shroud of Turin is uh, one, you know, alleged manifestation of this. Um, Betty's picture made in Rome in the early 17th century kind of connects to our story about American superstition and even to the role of the trees in this and how does it do that as you look at the savior looking um, down as if still at the ground uh, on which we can imagine him to have been burdened as he was staring in dejection and pain when Veronica wiped his brow, so perfected, so superstitiously complete is her representation and Fetti's representation of her representation that finally there is no difference. There is no difference between art and life in this picture. How does it connect to the forest? Well, a very interesting person, no one less than Francis Parkman, 
had an encounter with the Veil of Veronica in 1844 in Rome, which should have decisive importance for our understanding of the portrayal of trees and how they are connected somehow to this world of superstition I wish to claim was still alive in the 1830s in America, in progressive America. So Parkman's writing to his letter, this is, or to his mother just before, just before uh, his uh, oration, his commencement oration at Harvard, which he gave later that year and which I've quoted from in these lectures. And he's like a good Boston Brahmin making fun of the Catholic uh, ritual. He says, we're in the midst of the fooleries of Holy Week. Tonight the Pope took mass and toasted the high altar in presence of some 10,000 people in the church. The handkerchief on which Christ wiped his face and which contains the impressions of his features was exhibited in great state from a gallery in St. Peter's, so high that the holy relic could scarce be seen so that the people bowed and crossed themselves on trust. So you might say so far, well, this is just almost like the Mount picture. This is an American who knows better, who has a kind of rational worldview, who's kind of creating his identity based upon his distancing himself from superstition, but not so fast. Because if we go now to Parkman's writing, which he devoted the rest of his life to, his story of uh, the 18th century in particular in America, there are these incredible, I think of them as set pieces of the forest where he's describing trees. You recall how even when he was 21, he was so deeply invested in the destruction of the forest and the, the, the lamentation of that destruction and hence of uh, the need to preserve it, at least in his writing. And his writing takes on, dare I say it, a kind of um, substantial, like transubstantial power in the way we would expect of any good, solid, uh, vivid, you might even say wet writing that makes us see the world in the other medium of just text. So. Uh, in his book, Montcalm and Wolf, um, about the 18th century, Parkman says, the bateau were dragged on sledges and launched on the dark and tortuous stream, which fed by a decoction of forest leaves that oozed from the marshy shores, crept in shadow through depths of foliage with only a belt of illumined sky gleaming between the jagged treetops. There's the up tall and lean with straining towards the light, their rough giant stems trickling with perpetual damps. It's such a Catholic description, I think, of the forest. Stood on either side, the silent hosts of the forest. And he goes on in that same passage, the skeletons of their dead. It's almost like a kind of um, relic, you know, a charnel house here, almost a kind of Roman setting, but he's talking about the trees, the skeletons of their dead. Barkless, blanched and shattered, strewed the mud banks and shallows. You can almost imagine what pleasure he had in writing this. Others lay submerged like bones of drowned mammoths, thrusting lank white limbs above the sullen water. And great trees, entire as yet, were flung by age or storms athwart the current, a bristling barricade of matted boughs. So here is Parkman, all the way at the end of his life, you know, still writing feverishly. He died in 1893, but recalling basically the Catholic uh, substantial language, the presentifying language, make the world present, make it vivid uh, of his youth, the, the language he affected to scorn, but sort of like Mount with Caravaggio, couldn't quite scorn, but needed. One more description, this now from General Braddock's uh, march through the woods of Pennsylvania, so a kind of homage to Braddock Road here in Northern Virginia, which of course refers to the road down which General Braddock and his doomed troop marched to be slaughtered in the woods in 1755. Foot by foot, they advanced into a realm of forest ancient as the world. This is, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I love Parkman. The road was but 12 feet wide and the line of march often extended for miles, trailing slowly through the depths of leaves, creeping round inaccessible heights, crawling over ridges, moving always in dampness and shadow, again, this kind of wet language, by rivulets and waterfalls, crags and chasms, gorges and shaggy steeps, the kind of saliva that's involved in just saying these words is somehow of a piece with the, the world they portray. And glimpses only through jagged boughs and flickering leaves. 
Did this wild primeval world reveal itself with its dark green mountains flecked with the morning mist and its distant summits penciled in dreamy blue? You need, in other words, a wild primeval world, a kind of pan, a kind of um, wild primeval language to portray a wild primeval world. You need a pantheistic language. Which brings me to Parkman himself and the following point about everything I've been saying. How does one make for this superstitious matching of world and word, uh, world and word, world and paint? This is a photograph of Parkman from the early 1840s, roughly from the time when he was writing to his mother and giving his Harvard commencement address, that is 1844. Photography, uh, of course, itself is a kind of Veronica's veil, not, not unnoted as such from its inception, which is its own story. But here, I wish for you just to think of Parkman himself and think of, as I go through now, what, is its, what, what, what are the methods, an academic would dryly say. But I might say more like, what are the modes by which you connect word and world, or paint and world, or history and the past, you know, here's the first, and it's with Parkman, and you know what it is? It's pain, because in that very trip to Rome, he says very prophetically, I've been spending a few days in a convent of the monks called Passionists, the strictest order in Rome, who thrash themselves daily with iron lashes, wear hair shirts, get up at midnight to make a procession and prayer, and live on peas and fish. He then goes on to say that they're actually pretty nice to him, and they seem to show sincere regret at his eternal damnation. Um, <laughs> but he then goes on to say, I have been a perfect anchorite here, have given up wine, etc., and live at present on 40 cents a day for provisions. And you know, it's interesting, Parkman went over there because he was having some kind of nervous breakdown. And his story of staying with these passionists kind of predicts his whole life as a writer. And this is where I come to this word pain. Um, you know, he started out, he went, he retraced uh, Lewis and Clark's uh, trail in the later 1840s had horrible dysentery, started to develop all kinds of afflictions, the most famous of which was, were these incredible, blinding headaches. And much of Montcalm and Wolfe, as Simon Shama describes in his book, Dead Certainties, about Parkman, was written in the dark, um, was because light was too offensive um, to Parkman. Written in the dark or dictated to someone. Uh, so pain is the price, a kind of martyr, martyrdom, psychosomatic or real or both, is entailed if one would summon the past in that wet manner, that transubstantiary, uh, substantive manner I spoke of before. What's another way to make your words and the world match? Again, it's very fraught, and you can hardly imagine with Edgar Allan Poe there in this daguerreotype from 1849, the year of his death, what it might be with him. But let's go back to the 1830s, and I'll say the way he wrote himself might well have been the lucidest thing in the world. It's like I tell my students about Jackson Pollock. I mean, it was when Pollock was not painting that he had trouble um, figuring out how to be. But when he was painting, everything was, it was the center of the storm, the eye of the hurricane, not the hurricane itself. So may it have been for Poe, but Poe's portrayals of writing and reading are hallucinatory about what's involved in connecting to the world. So in this book, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket from 1838, which I spoke about in the first lecture, uh, it's a stowaway scene at first where, you know, in youthful hijinks, thinking they'll go out on the high seas for a great adventure, Arthur Gordon Pym and his buddy Augustus fashion the stowaway of Arthur beneath decks on a ship going out from Nantucket. And the whole plan is that Arthur will lay below decks until they're sufficiently out at sea that he, uh, then he can reveal himself and he'll have to become part of the crew then. Augustus, meanwhile, is part of the crew. But Poe, or Pym, 
spends a lot of time, too much time, starting to get mad at Augustus, like, where is Augustus? I've been behold, below decks in this cramped quarters, kind of in this fetal uh, tomb position for, you know, you guessed it, three days and three nights. What's going on? He needs to get some kind of message or receive a message, and finally he gets one, but he can't read it. You know, how do you connect with the world in the hold of your life, in the kind of enclosed blindness of your life, and, in, and really in the enclosed blindness of writing and reading. What to do next, I could not tell, Pym says. Uh, the hold was so intensely dark that I could not see my hand, however close I would hold it to my face. The white slip of paper, which is Augustus is communicating with him at last about what's going on, could barely be discerned. The gloom of my prison may be only imagined. In vain, I revolved in my brain a multitude of absurd expedients for procuring light. Like, how can I see the world? How can I escape my, you know, tombed darkness here of my kind of, um, the enclosure of myself? Such expedients precisely as a man in the perturbed sleep of opium would be apt to fall upon for a similar purpose, each and all of which appear by turns to the dreamer the most reasonable and the most preposterous of conceptions. So, you know, as a historian, I could relate to that, that, um, you know, we're in our darkness, we would summon the past, we would summon the world, the methods or modes by which we would do so from our extreme or radical enclosure are at once uh, affected in a dream, and they seem reasonable, they seem preposterous by turns. It's all a hallucination. And Pym goes on to say now, he has a little bit of phosphorus, the remnants of matches. Finally, is that what we work on? Is that what I'm doing right now? Is basically, I would illuminate. I'm being illuminated, but wouldn't I really finally have just the remnants of a few pieces, a few matches to illuminate the past? But here is what Pym does, having rubbed the phosphorus, a brilliancy has ensued as before, but this time several lines of manuscript in a large hand, and apparently in red ink, became distinctly visible. Here's a glimmer of something, of the world up above, uh, the world out there. The glimmer, although sufficiently bright, was momentary. Still, had I not been too greatly excited, there would have been ample time enough for me to peruse the whole three sentences before me, for I saw there were three. In my anxiety, however, to read all at once, I succeeded only in reading the seven concluding words which thus appeared, and which themselves have this kind of um, Christian or Catholic feeling to it, seven concluding words. Blood, your life depends upon lying close, like stay, uh, stay there. So, you know, there's the story of Arthur's um, stowing away on this ship, but there's also the commentary finally on who we are, what we do when we wish to make words written or read connect to the world. And for Poe, it is a kind of, it's just, there's a state of utter privation and of hallucination and of glimmers and glimpses uh, that is entailed in that process. And here is another one which I think I relate to a lot. Um, you know, this is Caroline Kirkland, not at all well known now, but who wrote quite a best selling book, A New Home Who Will Follow, in 1839, about being a middle class homesteader out in the wild and woolly state of Michigan, which had only come into being, I believe, in 1837. And she, like the figures in the Mount painting, is describing her kind of humorous distance from a world of superstition. A boy has been bitten by a rattlesnake. The boy had been fishing in the stream, and in kneeling to search for bait, had roused the snake, which bit him just above the knee. The entire limb was frightfully swollen and covered with large, livid spots, and here's the superstition, exactly like the snake, as the woman, that is, Kirkland's companion, stated with an air of mysterious meaning. So when I saw the body of the snake, which the father had found without difficulty and killed very ne near the scene of the accident, I, here, you know, um, prim and proper, found it difficult to trace the resemblance between its brilliant colors and the purplish brown blotches on the poor boy's leg. But the superstition once received, imagination supplies all deficiencies, and indeed the people around all swear by this, no matter what the evidence of their eyes. I think what is striking to me about this passage is the way 
it suggests that not just pain, but a kind of bite, a poison bite is necessary if the world is to enter into us. And I know Kirkland, as a rationalist, puts this all at a distance from her, but I nonetheless seize on this superstition as having great um, potential or significance, or let's just say I relate to it when I think about what it is to study the past. The Holocaust, for example. I would think of, uh, you know, have I put pen to paper on that subject just now in my 50s, a little bit? But I would describe that as a good example of the bite, the poison bite, like you're gonna have to it's gonna hurt, you know? I mean, I'm not being vainglorious in the slightest. I'm sort of reporting the truth. Um, it is painful. You are bitten by what you study. Uh, it's just a fact. And if you're not, then, you know, I don't know. I don't know quite what that means. Maybe it's at too great a distance from you. So pain, hallucination, the bite, the sudden bite, which is a particular kind of pain, but there's also another of these modes, enchantment. And I think this is true of me too, and I'm, I'm sure it's true of a lot of writers. Um, Henry David Thoreau, shown here later in life in the 1850s, but a young man just graduated from Harvard in 1837, starting his journals He's there in uh, Concord on a hill called Nashatuck, which is since uh, he spells with a T at the end, it's now dropped that T. And he's basically, you know, the world comes to him not through pain, not through hallucination, not through bite, a bite, but through a kind of, um, let's say it like a kind of determined indolence of letting the world come to you. One must needs climb a hill to know what a world he inhabits. I think that's so true. This is precisely not tragic. In the midst of this Indian summer, I am perched on the topmost rock of Nashatuck, a velvet wind blowing from the southwest. I seem to feel the atoms as they strike my cheek. Hills, mountains, steeples stand out in bold relief in the horizon while I am resting on the rounded boss of an enormous shield. Thoreau had just been reading Homer and I think the, the recollection of the 18th book of the Iliad and the description of the world in a work of art, namely the Shield of Achilles is present in that metaphor. The river like a vein of silver encircling its edge and thence the shield gradually rises to its rim, the horizon. Not a cloud is to be seen, but villages, villas, forests, mountains, one above another till they are swallowed up in the heavens. The atmosphere is such that as I look abroad upon the length and breadth of the land, it recedes from my eye, and I seem to be looking for the threads of the velvet, which I read as almost like, show me how this is constructed, show me the way that the velvet winds and the whole velvet scene are actually threaded together in some sort of conceit or concoction of human beings, but I'm, I don't actually see those threads, and so he says, thus I admire the grandeur of my emerald carriage with its border of blue in which I am rolling through space. Uh, the observer, the historian, the writer, however you want to call it, to connect with the world, indeed to make the world, to perceive the world he inhabits, must float uh, through space, must be light, not painful and heavy, and then will uh, an almost Homeric vision of the loveliness of Concord emerge. All of these are methods or modes of making world and word, world and painting match. Here I want to suggest something very different, which is the following. Like, what about the kind of art, with a capital A, that is emerging at this time that wants actually to forsake the world? to escape from the world, to do so as a measure of its own value and quality, precisely not to seek for this superstitious connection, um, but to avoid it altogether. And that allows me to say something about this very famous work on the screen, which is called The Greek Slave, and it was made by the Vermont-born, Woodstock Vermont-born sculptor Hiram Powers, who was born in 1805, and you know, the original conception of this in Florence was from 1843, and then it became, there are many versions of it, 
Uh, this one at Yale is from 1850. Uh, very famous sculpture of the 19th century, often taken to be exactly about the world. You know why? The Greek slave, slave being the key word, slave referring here, it's a white woman, but referring to uh, implicitly the story is the imprisonment uh, of a virtuous white woman who is being bid upon by Turkish men at a, a slave auction or slave bazaar. This has to do with the Greek wars for independence in the earlier 19th century. But also, as made by an American, how could it not also comment on uh, the fact of African slavery in the United States? So sure, you could argue that. But I always feel we're dealing with kind of um, poor returns and poor rewards if we're going to nominate this picture as our emblem of the catastrophe, the, the trauma of slavery. It always feels extremely almost sugary, sugarily distant from that. And I think this is my point about art with a capital A and about how I'm to say that this work is distant from life. How so? Powers said that the, the, the inspiration for this work really came from a dream he had as a recurring dream he had as a little boy, which was seeing this floating white woman, like alabaster woman across the river from his cousin's farm in Vermont on a pedestal or pillar, he said, inaccessible across the river, but this dream, unlike everything else in the world, this floating white woman, sculptural, uh, perfected. Notice again, unlike anything else in the world. And I think that stayed with him as he moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, then a rough and rugged frontier town with his family in the year 1818 at age 13. And as he, um, found his way there, uh, he was, you know, experiencing the rough and tumble world that this kind of sculpture is ultimately going to forsake. How so? Um, he worked at a wax museum called the Western Museum, and Hiram Power's job in the 1820s, or maybe early 1830s, as a young man with his modeling facility was to model figures in wax for a um, hell scene. And you know there would be um, lightning and muttering thunder and the groans of the damned. And there would be wax figures burning in hell. And occasionally, just to liven things up, Hiram Powers would dress himself as Satan wearing a death's head and a lobster claw on his nose. And as he said later, approach some breathless rustic and said, don't you smell sulfur? Uh, but it is that kind of um, world of cheap thrills and consumer entertainments that this work kind of miraculously wants to escape. It's the same thing when Powers somewhat improbably wanted another one of his sculptures, very similar to this one, to be installed in the rough and ready mining camp at Sutter's Mill upon the discovery of gold in 1848. One can only imagine how the miners in that crude all-male community would have regarded the apparition in marble of such a figure as this one. Powers, I think, meant it to be um, uh, you know, um, an emblem of how art, by being unlike the rest of the world, by, by being something that almost prophylactically wants to shed all the squalor and tawdriness of the world could be a thing unto itself and could gleam in a kind of virginal white silence as a thing to be valued because it is separate from the world, because it is a respite from the world, because it is, if you like, meaningless. And, you know, Powers, another one of Powers' early jobs confirms that he was a money collector in the woods of Ohio outside Cincinnati. And if you think of the tawdriness and despair and disaster that the Greek slave in its perfection wants to escape, think of this anecdote. In his capacity as money collector, Powers would emerge from a dark wood, this is in southern Ohio, in some rural location, finding himself near a clearing where the farmer's house I was seeking lay, and pick up a stout club to defend myself against the inevitable dog that guarded these remote farms. He would often find in one of these squalid huts, sickness and death in these fever-stricken abodes, a wan mother nursing one dying child with perhaps another dead one in the house. No wonder he wants to create something totally apart. 
but nonetheless he would need to collect the money because the man of the house had bought something he did not need from a peddler, something like a wooden clock ticking off, power says, the last minutes of the sick child. So, you know, art should be something that allows us to escape. This is coming into being at this time. As much as Jedediah Williamson is still present to us now, superstitiously, so a work like this wants to shed the world and announce its value by virtue of its separation from what we call life. This is my own Paterian um, description then of the Greek slave. In her purity and silence, one hears clanking hammers and kicked spittoons. She has trafficked with hucksters and charlatans and industrial captains. She has heard the percussion of the foundry and the boom of the cannon just as surely as she has heard the declamations of the abolitionist and the slave master, the whimperings of the besotted lover, the snores of the bored man with a crumpled program in his hand, and the slow clattering of the horse's hooves as the sad and sorry wagon passes the exhibition hall. All these sounds she contains and destroys, exorcises and erases, not missing a beat, making a silence so perfect that truly this work is sure to say nothing at all. So she is, if you like, the grand muffler, sound absorber who takes all the derelict, um, fallen sounds of the ordinary world and quiets them into a white silence that allows the beholder a kind of therapeutic calm and recovery. It is, if you like, a kind of disastrous turn for art. And if you don't want to take my word for it, take Ralph Waldo Emerson's word for it. In his essay, Art, from 1841, he says this about sculpture such as powers, not thinking of this one in particular, which is yet to be made, but in effect, this whole vein of American art. Emerson says, 1841, under an oak tree loaded with leaves and nuts, under a sky full of eternal eyes, I stand in a thoroughfare like I'm everywhere and in a specific place, which is always the best combination. But in the works of our plastic arts, and especially of sculpture, creation is driven into a corner. I cannot hide from myself, it's so great when writers are so thoroughly honest as Emerson is, I cannot hide from myself that there is a certain appearance of paltriness, as of toys and the trumpery of a theater in sculpture. I do not wonder that Newton, with an attention habitually engaged on the paths of planets and suns, should have wondered what the Earl of Pembroke found to admire in stone dolls. This is just his plaintive plea is my plaintive plea. Why does art have to not be about life? How did it get fathomed off, sidetracked? Um, why is it that I've written a piece about this that's called um, When Did Art Become Meaningless? And this is Emerson again, now thumping home the point with specific reference to his own America. The old tragic necessity, notice that necessity is, cap is capitalized, which lowers on the brows of even of the Venuses and Cupids of the antique. So then, you know, it mattered. These things were consequential and furnishes the sole apology for the intrusion of such anomalous figures into nature, namely that the artist was drunk with a passion for form which he could not resist and which vented itself in these fine extravagances, no longer dignifies the chisel or the pencil. The artist and the connoisseur now seek in art the exhibition only of their talent or an asylum from the evils of life. So exactly as I said, and this feels to me true too. They reject life as prosaic and create a death which they call poetic. I wonder therefore what Hiram Powers and maybe even Emerson would say about this and its connection to art and life. What even is it as we adjust our eyes? It's the Lord's Prayer we're now moving on from Hiram Powers and to an artist, says M.A. Honeywell, Martha Ann Honeywell, who was born in 1786 and lived to 1860. It's the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
etc. You see, it says, goes all the way down. It says, written without hands by M.A. Honeywell. So written without hands by Martha Ann Honeywell, this Lord's Prayer piece, which you can see the, the size of now by virtue of this comparison with a penny, this piece, one of the few surviving works by Martha Ann Honeywell is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, what does she mean written without hands? Well, she had no hands. Uh, she was born with birth defects, Westchester County, 1786, had only the first joints of her arms, and had no toes on one foot and three toes on, one, on the other foot. So how did she do this? There's a scholar named Laurel Dane, D-A-E-N, who's the preeminent scholar on Martha Ann Honeywell. Laurel um, completed her dissertation at William & Mary only very recently, 2016. Uh, she's the go-to person about Martha Ann Honeywell. But let me say this, that um, she wrote with her toes. So it's true, written without hands. And she also cut paper and embroidered and here is the whole piece now. It's about eight inches from top to bottom. By using a combination of her toes, her one stump, and her mouth, so she would hold the paper in her toes, and with one part of the scissors in her mouth and the other with her arm, she would cut the paper. So this is all her work here. And you might say, therefore, that this might fall into what Emerson um, laments as the state of art with a capital A. Then it's a it's a kind of a kind of hucksterism or Barnum-esque style, um, almost like a freak show, you might say. But I feel there's something more um, genuine about this uh, and about Martha Ann Honeywell's project that allows us to talk about how the world gets into art. And, you know, if you look at these tree-like, these foliage forms, you know, which in, them, in their own way are a kind of evocation of the forest in miniature, you know, this is how I describe it. Although it does not represent an identifiable object, no leaf looks like it. The paper cutout abounds in natural forms. If one were to press into the whirrings and secret heart of a pine cone, or a piece of bark, or a blade of grass, one would find pattern upon pattern a similar intricacy. Honeywell's cutout implies a secret symmetry to the natural world, an infinite delicacy beyond what the eye can see. You know, if one would really mystically behold what the world is, what the natural world is, it would reveal itself in these secret symmetries. Although she has made it, the implication is that she has revealed magically, without hands, the image without hands, the unity and diversity, the complex simplicity that underwrites the world. You know, the theology of the world, much as a Victorian write, writer might con conceive the snowflake as embodying in microcosm all that the cosmos is. So the full theology of this picture, which therefore I can imagine Emerson completely to embrace, would be something like this. The Lord's Prayer at the center, the pith and heart of the outward flow of forms, generates the gentle fur and serrated feathers of the star's ruffled surface. As the smallest and most unbelievable thing in the cutout, the writing is the prayer at the center of all natural beauty, an umbilicus from which flows the capillaries and veins and arteries that see to the life of the whole. In transcendentalist terms, this is what Emerson would call the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. And I think it matters very much in the context of this story that uh, not just pain, not just hallucination, not just enchantment, not just the bite, but some kind of um, some kind of tragedy is the precondition for this would-be saint's articulation of what life is.
So, no account of superstition would be complete without the accounter, the historian, being superstitious himself. And that's what's going to allow me to say something about this marvelous painting by the uh, Renaissance painter Pontormo uh, that relates to our story today. This is a painting from Italy, from Florence, from the year 1513 when Pontormo was only 19 years old. It was painted for the side of a uh, carriage for a uh, celebratory festival uh, having to do with, the, um, with Leo X becoming the new pope in 1513, 24 by 18 inches, showing, as some of you will recognize, uh, the story of Apollo and Daphne, with Daphne, beautiful nymph, being pursued by Apollo, and rather than succumb to his embraces, turning herself or being turned into a laurel tree, which Pontormo shows magically, part of his call to show the uh, transformations of the gods for this pageant. What's interesting, what's superstitiously vivid for me is that this painting is at, all pla at of all places, Bowdoin College, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's alma mater. It was given there for decidedly non-superstitious reasons in 1961 by the Crest Foundation, just allotting glorious works of art to different locations in America. But there's something so Hawthornian about this, not just the myth, but really the painting that makes me want to think about the two in relation. And let me then kind of rhyme this through or thread this through a little sort of backstory of my own mind as I've been thinking about this lecture, which is ever since I first learned about the murder of Helen Jewett, you know, I've been thinking, wow, I'd love to go to Augusta, Maine, where she was from, and look at the trees. I wonder if she was dreaming of the trees when the skull, when, her, when the ax split her skull. You know, how, how do we carry forth who we are, where we came from, all the way up into, even in, through somehow our death? And, you know, I realized at a certain point I didn't even need to go to Maine because Hawthorne was doing it for me right after, right after Helen Jewett's death. So as I read Hawthorne's description of returning to Maine not long after he graduated from Bowdoin, hanging out with a friend, being in the area around Augusta, Maine, where, where Helen Jewett, or Dorcas Doyen, worked, you know, I just felt like she was present somehow as I was reading the American notebooks. The farther we went up the brook, the wilder it grew. The opposite bank was covered with pines and hemlocks ascending high upwards, black and solemn. One knew there must be almost a precipice behind, yet we could not see it. The writing is kind of urgent, activated. At the foot you could spy a little way within the darksome shade, the roots and branches of the trees, but soon all sight was obstructed amidst the trunks, Hawthorne entering into one of his mysterious forests. On the hither side, at first the bank was bare, then fringed with alder bushes, bending and dipping into the stream, almost a kind of um, maidenly or nymph-like feeling there, which farther on flowed through the midst of a forest of maple, beech, and other trees, its course growing wilder and wilder as we proceeded. For a considerable distance, there was a causeway. Now the lumbering industry comes in, built long ago of logs to drag lumber upon. It was now decayed and rotten, so something somber and melancholy, a red decay, sometimes sunken down in the midst, here and there a knotty trunk stretching across, apparently sound. The sun being now low towards the west, a pleasant gloom and brightness were diffused through the forest, spots of brightness scattered upon the branches or thrown down in gold upon the last year's leaves among the trees. So in a way, all of life is in that description. And in the vagaries of my superstitious mind as a historian, yes, I'm thinking of Helen Jewett. So imagine my surprise, or should I say lack of surprise, when the next year Hawthorne, elsewhere in Massachusetts this time, encounters a show of wax figures consisting almost wholly of murderers and their victims. Hel Ellen Jewett, so another one of her false names, and R.P. Robinson, she dressed richly in extreme fashion and very pretty. 
he, awkward and stiff, it being difficult to stuff a figure to look like a gentleman. The showman seemed very proud of Ellen Jewett and spoke of her somewhat as if this wax figure were a real creation. And among the people who were there looking, Hawthorne notes several decent looking girls and women who I, Ellen herself, with more interest than the other figures. You notice the tree here. And by the 1830s, the so-called Jane McRae tree looked like this uh, in its dying state. Um, Benson Lawsing, a historian who wrote a book called The Pictorial Field Book of the Revolution, drew this picture as faithfully as he could of this site, of this tree allegedly under which Jane McRae was murdered. And the kind of casual figures here fenced away from this reliquary object um, perhaps indicate the somewhat distanced or removed or merely touristic relation to the animacy of the past and of personal tragedy. But Lossing notes the vividness of this tree and laments its soon to be death in fact, the tree died in 1849, and not long after, in 1853, the owner of the property on which the tree was had it cut down and turned into canes and boxes, which he then sold on Broadway at various stores, advertising it as these canes and boxes as having been made from the Jane McRae tree, advertising the canes and boxes as relics in basically the Catholic sense of a martyr. And though no, no uh, trace of those canes or boxes has ever been found, so as far as I know, and though the tree, of course, is long since gone, yet that tree and yet those canes and boxes attest to the persistence of this superstitious power in American culture then, and so more importantly, I suggest, for so I would dearly love to hold one of those boxes in my hands, uh, the ongoing power of superstition in the writing of history today. Thank you. <laughs>